Good morning. Welcome to Covenant. If you're outside, go ahead and make your way in here. And uh, we'll begin our worship service. Thank you again. Thanks for being here. Hope your summer's off to a great start, or at least above average, or even slightly above average. Average would be adequate. Glad you are here. I'm going to pray that God would help you right now just to put away all the things that distract you. I know it's hard. I do know that's hard to, to focus, um, but it's a great opportunity for us to meet together and to meet with God, and that's what we don't want to miss. So if you would pray with me right now. Father, thank you for gathering us together. The amount of uh, challenges in this room of just getting here, the logistics of just getting all these individuals in one room at the same place for one reason is amazing. And I bow my heart and my life before you to say thank you for doing that. We need each other, God, and we need you desperately. And we want to do more than sing and listen. We want to meet with you. So help us by giving us and granting us a spirit of worship. The ability to put aside the things that don't matter for the thing, the one thing that truly does matter. And that's you. Just help us connect. Help us to hear and respond to you. To do more than go through the, the rituals and the, and the uh, traditions that we hold. And that we hold dear. But we want them to draw us to you and not just to go through them. So move now. Reveal yourself, startle us with how near you are and how powerfully present you are. And we will love you in return, ask you to give us that faith and that hope. Bless the service in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Thank you. Why don't you stand and greet one another for a moment, and then we'll have the kiddos come up front for the children's sermon. As the children come forward for the children's message, adults, you can be seated. Well, I'll come down here and join you a little closer. Hey, good morning. Uh, it's the second day or third day. What is today? The 23rd? It's the third day of summer. Did you know that? Summer just started three days ago. One of the things I like about summer is the time when fruit is, is fresh. Do y'all like any kind of fruit? What's your favorite kind of fruit? I wasn't asking y'all. You don't get to participate. The rest of the hour is about y'all. <laughs> just teasing you. What, what's your favorite kind of fruit? I like strawberries too. Watermelon? Watermelon? No one said that in the first service. I love watermelon and strawberries. Yes. What else? What's your favorite kind of fruit in the summertime? You like green apples? Oh, that is good. Very good. What else do you like? What do you like? Apples. Very good. Anything else? Other kinds of fruit that you like? Anybody like bananas a whole lot? Bananas. What do you like? Strawberries. What about what? Pineapple, fresh pineapple especially. Grapes, you like grapes? Red or green, I like. What? Raspberries? What? Blue? Oh, I, blueberries. Right. There's all kind of fruit. And you know what? Where does fruit come from? The store? No, we get it from the tree. Trees are vines. Grapes grow in vines. And peaches and all those kind of things are, are sometimes bushes. 
Yeah. So those trees or the bushes are what produces the fruit. So let me share something real quick and then I'll answer your questions. So the trees and the bushes produce the fruit, right? They, we don't, fruit didn't just fall out of the sky. Something produces it. It's pretty amazing. And like an orange tree doesn't produce grapes and a grapevine doesn't produce apples. Each kind of bush or tree produces its own kind of fruit. Did you know that God uh, wants you to produce fruit too? It's a different kind of fruit, of course. No one's going to walk around with grapes hanging off their ears or oranges growing off their elbows or anything like that. But it's a different kind of fruit. Do you know what kind of fruit God wants to have you ha produce in your life? Do you know, name anything? Say the fruit of the Spirit. Ah, oh, very good. What are some of the fruits of the Spirit? Can you name any of the fruits of the Spirit? That passage starts off, if you're familiar with it, the fruit of the Spirit is what? What's one? Peace is one. What's another one? What's it start with? Does anybody remember that? The fruit of the Spirit is love. And then what? Does anybody know the next one? I like the next one a lot. I know you know this. Joy, peace, patience, hiccups. No, that's not one. Gentleness, goodness, self-control, all those things. Those are fruits. Those are the things that, listen to me, Carson. Those are the things that God produces in your life. So your job is to not be a patient person. Your job is to be a disciple of Jesus. And a disciple of Jesus stays connected with Jesus. They talk and listen and stay with Jesus, obediently following him. And then Jesus produces fruit in your life. This amazing fruit. Who wouldn't want to be filled with love and joy and peace and patience? Oh, I miss those things when they're not present in my life. That fruit is really important. Listen, I love fresh oranges, fresh pineapples, grapes, and strawberries. But I love even more to be filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. Those things, those are awesome. So I'm going to pray for you that you would walk with Jesus this summer and so that you could stay connected to him by reading your Bible and praying, staying close to your church family. Those things are very important. That's how we stay connected to Jesus. So I'm going to pray for you on that, that God would just fill you with the fruit. So you don't have to try so hard to be a good person. You could try really hard to stay connected to Jesus. Let him produce the fruit. Okay, let's pray. God, thank you so much for our kids. I want to ask you to help us to all take responsibility in this church family, to love them and to set examples for them, to stay connected ourselves so that they could see what a growing relationship with Jesus looks like, and that, God, you would show them how to do that, and as they do, that you would produce this kind of fruit in their life, the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of a person. It's your fruit, and you produce it, and you told us if we'll remain in you and your words remain in us, we would bear much fruit. So bless them today with that. Thank you for it. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Listen, I got some candy for you to remind you of the fruit. Don't be picky on the kind. Just come up and grab a piece, all right? And then go have a seat. All right. There you go. All right, if you'd stand and reflect with us this morning um, on the person of Jesus, just who he is. The song we're about to sing talks about how he's good and he is hope, he is joy, he is love, he is peace. And it's not just that he has those things, he doesn't just possess them, but he defines them. His character defines those things. So he'll sing with us today about that. nothing good in me you are love you are love on display for all to see you are light you are light when the darkness closes in you are hope you are hope you have covered all my sin. you are peace you are peace when my fear is crippling, you are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, in you death has lost its sting. And no, I'm running to your arms. 
come running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the It never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. And it's higher than the mountains that I face. It's stronger than the power of the grave. Constant in the trial and the change. It's one thing remains. This one thing remains. Your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me yes your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails 
cause it never gives up, never runs out on me, your love. On and on and on and on it goes, it overwhelms and satisfies my soul, and I never ever have to be afraid. It never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your
Last week, uh, we talked a little bit about, I shared a story actually about a man that um, by praying with him uh, really altered my perception and my understanding of prayer. Not because of a technique that he displayed, but a passion and authenticity he had in and through prayer. And the man's name was Riley Hamilton and he had come to do a revival, a prayer revival service for us at Corinth Baptist Church. And Subsequently, I remember um, setting some new goals in our church, praying in a different way. And one of the things we did every year as an association of churches is we had a high attendance Sunday. And um, it was just a push to invite people to connect with people. And we began to pray about that day. And I think at the time, I really don't remember the numbers very specifically. They're kind of incidental anyway. But we probably had 60 or 70 people come into the worship service and I think we prayed for double. Uh, we were praying for a specific number, though. We we're praying, I think, it seems like 120. It could have been 130. It could have been 110. But we were praying for a very specific number. And do you remember this, Kelly? Do you remember that time? We were praying exactly for a number. And, and when the day came, you know, I do remember thinking, you know, what do you say if you prayed for this and, you know, you only have two-thirds? Well, God just you know, gave us what we wanted or gave us what we needed and, or excuse him somehow or what do you do? And so I remember thinking that way and I was absolutely blown away when literally there was the exact number of people in that worship center that we had prayed for. Now it wasn't an oddball like 122. It was a round number, but regardless, it was that exact number. And I remember this thinking, you know, the temptation would be to take that as like a church growth strategy. Like, wow, we don't have to talk to people anymore. We don't have to do any outreach. We'll just pray and they will show up independent of relationship or my witness. And of course that would be crazy. But what God showed us was that he was ready and willing to listen. He was attentive. And certainly there are times and have been many times in my life when I prayed for something specific and there was not a direct answer. Or the answer was no. 
I mean, a very clear no. And uh, So I'm not saying that this is, you know, foolproof, like a strategy for getting God to do exactly what we want Him to do. But I am saying what God communicated to me and to our congregation at that time at Corinth was this, that I am listening. I think that's what He wanted to shout to us. Like, I'm listening very closely. The, the, the extreme, the infinite, ex, infinitely extreme low percentage or odds of, of the exact people showing up that day, just out of... I mean, just out of uh, the odds, it's crazy. It's beyond crazy. I mean, we're in rural Fannin County to double the attendance. Exactly, it's, it only could be God. The only explanation we had was that. You know, what God was showing us again was, was here I am. I'm with you. I'm listening when you talk to me. I want to respond, and I want you to know that. I don't know what your experience right now is in prayer. I have been preaching now four weeks about prayer and specifically with this hope that we as a congregation, you as individuals, we collectively as a congregation would enter into a new season of prayer, a new day of prayer. Not a renewed commitment, not a new determination, but a new day, a new uh, dawning of, of, of an experience and, uh, and a power and authenticity in our prayer lives. I don't know if you're bored with prayer I don't know if you're just doggedly committed to it, or I don't know if it's just blowing your world apart and you're just amazed by what God does in and through prayer. I really don't know that. But I do want to start together with a question. And let me preface the question by saying this. Jesus, I think, in my opinion, makes some absolutely outlandish promises about prayer. I mean, they're, if you just take them at face value, they sound crazy. Very honestly, they sound crazy to me. I mean, I know he's not crazy. I'm not calling Jesus crazy, but the way they land in my world, here's what I want to do. I want to qualify them. Even when he doesn't put the qualifications I want to put around them, I still want to do that. It's like I want to create excuses for Jesus before I stand on a promise in case it doesn't come through. So I tried to say, well, you can't, you can't just say that you can ask whatever you want. And because you've got to ask specifically, and, and I can get really, really narrow in how you ask and define that. And Jesus, you know, he just doesn't do that. So I'm going to ask you this question real quick, and we'll start. Would, would you, I'm talking to you specifically, not just us collectively, because we'll come together on this, but would, would you be willing to come to a point in your life, in your spiritual connection, in your only connection with God, to refuse to qualify or place conditions around Jesus' promises regarding prayer that he himself did not place there and simply take him at his word. Kind of a refrain this morning is, would you take Jesus at his word? When you take somebody at their word, you just take it as face value. Here's what he said. Let's not try to figure out another meaning or qualify it beyond his own qualifications. Let's just take it at face value. It is what it is. It's his word. Now, whether we want to argue with that or not is up to you individually. But would you be willing to stop what, you, what I think we do often, which is to qualify before we step out in faith so that we give him an excuse? Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? It's like, well, we'll get into that in a minute. Would you be willing to do that? Let me pray and ask God to just s capture us. Father, I'm going to pray right now before we read the word. And I'm asking you to quicken us, to hear it like you want us to hear it. Give us ears for it to soak into us, not just bounce around in our minds. May this message, this word that we're going to read, may it pierce us just as you intended for. I love you. I'm thankful to be among a congregation of people that loves you as well. It is in Jesus' great name. Amen. Here's what Jesus said. John chapter 15 and verse 7. I want you to stand in the honor of reading God's word. John chapter 15 and verse 7. If you don't have a Bible, just for future reference, if you didn't bring a Bible, you can always get one from the back. Uh, it's always on the screen. But I think there's something precious about holding God's word as we read it together. Here's, her, here's Jesus' words. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, 
and it will be done for you. That's God's word. Thank you. You can be seated. Before you uh, answer this question that I've, that I've put forth today, before you answer that, I want you to make sure you're asking that honestly and you're really getting what I'm saying. Because if you don't, if we're just going to jump through the hoops or we're just going to listen like we could really put it on autopilot and listen, then this is a waste of time. I, I need you to really be willing to ponder or consider what it is like to just look at Jesus' words and take them for what they say right there. Now, I'm going to ask you to trust me on something. And that is just a matter of your choice. I am promising you from my own heart that I've done my very best not to pull these words and this promise out of context, to isolate it, to make it sound like I can stand on something I can't. So I need you to trust that I've done some homework here and some study and looking at God's Word, not just this week, but collectively over the years as I've wrestled with this issue, to know that this statement is a synopsis of a broader teaching. Okay, this statement, now you can go and affirm that. I'm not asking you to take blind allegiance to it. But you can go back and dig through, but for this morning so that you can hear what I'm saying without that question kind of undermining of is this the whole, is he pulled out a teaching, is he pulled out a verse, and it's called eisegeting, pulling it out and isolating it out of its context, that's not happening, okay? So this is done in the context of an exegetical Bible study, okay? To pull out the meaning that is inherent. All right, so Jesus says this, let's walk through phrase by phrase, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. So the word abide means to remain. To stay, to be constant, to be steadfast, to be locked into something. Not to come and go, not to vacillate, not to be tentative or temporary. Okay? So he says, if you abide in me. That's a strange or kind of a foreign thought to abide in somebody. In somebody is his language. But we talk about this pretty freely in the, in the Christian evangelical circles that we run in in terms of we ask Jesus to come into our lives, to live in, in our hearts. The Holy Spirit indwells us. And then, but we flip that concept here when Jesus you says you stay in Him too. And it's the concept of being in intimate, personal relationship. Profound connection. So he says, if you stay in that connection with me, you stay connected and my words abide in you. That is His teaching, His words, His truth resonate in our lives because we've let them indwell us. We've taken them in. We've soaked them in. We've let them saturate our hearts and our minds. If those two things, you walk with me, you stay connected and let my words soak into your life and they stay there. They're not transitory. You let them kind of embed themselves into your heart, into your life through obedience to them. If that takes place, well, that's the condition for this incredible promise that's coming up. Relationship by the way, is the core purpose and condition of all true and effective prayer relationship is. And that's the condition. So here's the deal. If we're going to take Jesus at his word this morning, we have to know that this is the one singular condition he places around this mammoth promise that he's given to us. And I am very aware of my history with this promise. And I've added to this one condition, many, many things. I have been more pharisaical in this promise, meaning that I have added to the law, so to speak, like the Pharisees did, more than any one thing. Because I feel somehow an obligation to give Jesus an out if he doesn't come through on this promise. Isn't that insane? Isn't that crazy? Is it any wonder why this promise has been ineffectual over the long haul in my life and in most believers' lives because we're creating outs for him? Because we assume that he might not do what he said he's done. Isn't it, isn't it strange that we would do that? Instead of saying, well, you might need an out. It's, why don't we look at uh, us and say, what about the condition, the one condition? Just the one, relationship. Stay in right relationship with him. That's all he said there. That's all he said. And then he says these crazy words. This is an invitation. There's a condition right there. That's the condition we're to meet. Relationship. Just sum it up by saying relationship. Here's the invitation. Now this is a, a drawing us in. This is an arms open wide invitation to come to him. And he says, if you stay in right relationship, then ask whatever you wish. 
in the context of that kind of focus on relationship and in the context of being in that kind of relationship with Jesus, he makes this shocking, I think it's a shocking invitation. Well, I can take off my pastor lenses and forget that I've read this 3,000 times and, and just read it. Ask whatever you wish. Do you know what comes to my mind? My first rebuttal to that, and it's a rebuttal, almost every time it's a rebuttal, not, not oh, wow, thank you, but it's a rebuttal. And it's not really made to Jesus, it's kind of made to me. It's a self-rebuttal. Well, here's how it goes. You, you can't ask whatever you wish, you know. I mean, you can't just go asking for a million dollars to show up. You can't ask for, you can't just barge into Jesus' presence and ask him for a new house or, you know, you can't ask what, I mean, there's not whatever. There's, there's, there's limits to that. So I'm automatically going to the conditions, right, that he didn't even talk about prior to this. He said, focus on this one condition, right relationship. Then here's my invitation. Ask whatever you wish. And see how we mess that up? See how we convolute that process when we start going, well, not whatever. Wait, we dealt with the condition. You don't have to add anything else. We've already dealt with the conditions. Now stop going through in your mind, what if he doesn't come through, and just take him at his word. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask what? Whatever you wish. Those are Jesus' words. If they're troubling to you, I, I relate to you, first of all. But, you know, I, I just say, man, we're going to have to get over that. Because those are his choice of words. That's a very accurate translation. Ask, whatever you wish. Meeting that one condition of relationship, the doors get flung open wide. Ask it. Ask whatever you decide to ask. The disciples weren't going to be given a license to skip that condition, but they were being invited into this massive opportunity of request before God. Should they choose to accept the condition of prayer that Jesus promises to throw, radically throw open the doors of promise and hope? Not just kind of eat, eat some, He didn't say the door's unlocked. He said, ask whatever you wish. I mean, that's like kicking the door down and saying it's open. Barge in. It's not the only time Jesus made this kind of offer, by the way. There's several times, and I chose one that kind of synopsizes. Just Again, I want you to look at how, how consistent this is. Jesus said in John 14, just a chapter earlier, John 14, 13 through 14, he said, You can ask for anything. You can ask for anything. That's the invitation. Now, he does the invitation, and then the condition is second in this statement. You can ask for anything. How? In my name. In my name is the relationship. That, again, is a reiteration of the condition of relationship. In my name just, just oozes with relationship. That is, we're asking out of that relationship that we are, we are embedded with an identity of his name because we're in that relationship with him. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. Not I will do it if, not I will do it sometimes, but I will do it. These are Jesus' words to us. It, you can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. So that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Not so that you can be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous, and never have a cold again, or have perfect eyesight, or never have a broken down car, or never suffer through financial hardship, or never have a problem in your marriage, or raising your kids. He didn't say that. I, he said, you can ask for whatever you wish in my name, so that I can bring glory to the Father. Did you know it brings glory to the Father when Jesus is able to provide blessings to the people, who those blessings return praise and honor to Jesus, and it creates this cycle of adoration and praise and obedience as he responds it's a beautiful thing. Look at verse 14. It's a reiteration almost exactly. Yes, he starts off. In case you didn't get it the first time, in case you're stumbling over the shocking reality of my promise, yes, ask me for anything in my name. You know what's inherent in there? The implication is that the, the disciples hear verse 13. They go, really? Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it verse 13 says you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it verse 14 says yes ask me for anything in my name and I will do it now push pause and let me do one more condition and say this I am not a health and wealth and prosperity preacher most of you would know that if you've been here for any time at all but I am compelled by health wealth and prosperity that is we can't take scriptures like this and corner God and say uh, you're obligated you know 
You said it, so I get it. Come on, fork it over. You know, I prayed in your name. I prayed in your name, and now I get, you know, I sowed, and now I reap. You know, this is all about me and my benefit. That is not my message at all. I hope you hear that today. Now let's move forward. John picked this same thing up. The same, the Apostle John, the aged Apostle, 1 John. Listen to these words. Chapter 5, verse 14 through 15. This is not in your notes or on the screen. This is the confidence, John said. This is the confidence that we have before him in prayer is the, is the implication. That if we ask for anything, there's that crazy invitation. If we ask for anything, oh, the condition's not far behind it. It says, if we ask for anything according to his will, remain in me, my words remain in you, in my name according to his will. All three, the same condition. Wow, that's consistent, isn't it? That's amazing. The one condition. In fact, in all of the promises that he gives about prayer, he never goes around saying, well, you can't ask for anything. I mean, here's a list. It's got to really be beneficial to the kingdom. It can't really benefit you. It's just got to benefit the kingdom. I mean, you can't be asking for selfish stuff. He never does that. We shouldn't, but Jesus never causes us to wrestle with that stuff. It's like he's okay with causing this this riff in my mind and, and, and causing me to go, really? That's the subtitle is really? And that's because that's what I do with this wrestling all the time. He says, so if we ask for anything according to his will, he hear, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, in John 5, 5, 15, if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. So here's Jesus' last words in this phrase that I'm talking about today. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. That's the invitation. The condition, the invitation, here's the promise. It will be done for you. The certainty of those words just makes me pause every time. It will be done for you. Not if I have time or if you ask just right with the right amount of faith and humility and you ask enough times the right way and with the right amount of energy and passion and focus, then I might come through. He says, if you just meet this condition of relationship, here's the offer. I'll do whatever you need me to do, and I will do it for certain. It's done. Just trust it. It's done. So Jesus backs up this invitation to ask anything, this most extreme and unconditional promise, to do it. It'd be one thing. It'd be kind of comfortable for me if he said, you can ask whatever you want. I might do it. Never know. That's kind of how we pray, by the way. <laughs> Go ahead and ask. It doesn't hurt to ask. I say that all the time when I'm knocking on doors to ask permission for hunting. I tell Mike that all the time. We have our mind. Doesn't hurt to ask. What do they, they can say no. That's an answer. We approach prayer like that. Well, that's not the only thing they can do. They can slam the door in your face, too. If your nose is too close, it could hurt. It's true. They can say ugly things to you, too. So the landowners are different than God, all right? So, you can ask whatever you wish. It's a little side trail, okay? Come back with me now. Ask whatever you wish, and it'll be given. We say, what does it hurt? This is if we're really beyond the condition qualifying it to death. We could say, well, we can ask. It can't hurt. I mean, if it's not his will, he'll figure it out, and might as well ask. Again, that's just a gutting of this promise. We need to notice, I need you to linger on the fact that, uh, of the extreme lack of conditions. The one condition he gives you is all-encompassing. It's massive, it's true, but it's simple. It's simple. Stay in relationship. Sometimes it's a lot easier if you can focus, if you can imagine the physical. That if you can imagine a physical Jesus and following him physically, because that is the context. We're called to do that spiritually now, but in this day... He was speaking physically, I am here, follow me, all of those things. But it's nonetheless the same principle that we are following Jesus. That is, we don't let Jesus hang out over here and we kind of do life over here and send him an email every now and then. That's not abiding. We don't pick and choose the commandments or the teachings that we want to obey. That's not letting his word remain in us. We're radically committed to wholeheartedly obeying we're going to blow that obedience of course but our commitment our heart's desire is to obey to follow to yield that's what he's saying okay when you do that ask whatever you want it will be done 
These are Jesus' words. Guess what? They communicate exactly what Jesus wants to communicate. <laughs> Imagine that. I mean, these are very simple words. They don't require a lot of word studies. The Greek's simple. It's straightforward. And when you look at the word whatever in the Greek, it, you know what it means? Whatever. Lots of things. Kind of broad spectrum. Ask means to ask, to request. Whatever you wish means desire. It's all it's straightforward stuff. This is not complicated, you know, heady stuff. You know, walk with me. Ask whatever you wish. I will do it. My question that I want to just invite you into is why? Why does Jesus do this? Because it's not without risk, is it? This is not without the risk of abuse. Doesn't, what was he doing after all? Didn't Jesus know that he was going to be misunderstood here? Didn't Jesus know that, that people were going to take this statement and it would be abused by self-serving, worldly-minded people didn't he know that when he said this? Yeah. But that's okay to him. It's not okay to us, but it's okay to him. See, we're trying to prevent that from happening by saying, well, you can't ask for a pink Cadillac. You can't ask for a million dollars. You can't say that I want to win the lottery and exclude all the other people. You can't ask that stuff. We, Jesus is okay. He said the risk of that happening, the inevitability of that happening is okay. In fact, it's, it's a part of the deal. I've got to kick the doors wide open so that we invite everybody in so that no one has an excuse to not come to me in prayer. We've got to disqualify all the qualifications and say, if you come in my name, ask whatever is on your heart. This is way back in the Psalms and all that then I will grant it to you. I will do it. The scripture says in the Old Testament, uh, golly, just went blank. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Psalm something. Somebody that knows it better than me can shout it out in a minute. Jesus intended, he meant to, it was on purpose to throw open the doors of hope and promise so that we would be compelled. Or, you know what compelled means? It's like it's a desire, but it's more intense than a desire. It's a have to do this. He did this so that we would be compelled to rush to him in prayer with certain and radical confidence and in his responsiveness to us. <coughs> do you know <coughs> how often... Oh, that hurt. <coughs> that was a cough and a sneeze and several things at once. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you know how often I fail to come to Jesus? Me. Just me. With certain confidence in his responsiveness. Do you know I have actually grown up in a culture of the church that says I don't have to be expectant in prayer. I just got to pray. But I believe the whole premise of this, of Jesus throwing these doors open wide and letting the scandal of it all mix with the truth and the reality of it all is, is so that we would be certain to rush to him with everything without going, hmm, is this something I should pray about or not? I'm not sure if I should ask for that. What if, what if we stopped deciding that? Just check, what if Jesus was teaching us this? What if he said, just take the filter off for a little bit? And, and why don't you let me decide if this is worthy of my response or not? Huh. Why don't you just begin to ask, even if you're not certain? No one's ever going to be. So how many, how often, thank you, Roger. You don't want to ever hear that again, do you? Ah. Uh. Mm. What if we were just called to rush into his presence? Not self-servingly. The condition has to be met. So we come, and in, without thinking about, golly, I'm, Jesus, I'm not sure if this is what you want to do, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And, you know, I understand if it's not really your will, but I'm told that. What if we just said, I'm supposed to ask, so Jesus, would you bless? Would you bless my marriage with, with intimacy and, 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 and love and selflessness? Would you bless our congregation with a spirit of faith and vigor and desire and guess what it's, it is true that as you stay in relationship with Jesus he does transform your heart okay so that causes you to ask and focus and desire other things 
But what if we stopped and just said, we're bringing it to you, Jesus. We're bringing it to you. So the question, are you really, really willing to take Jesus at his word without killing, without killing the intent and the power of this promise by strangling it to death with self-imposed, our own imposition, self-imposed conditions? Are we willing to come to him, take him at his word and the power of this promise and not just kill it with our self-imposed conditions that leave us excuses for unexpected and listless faith. Can we really lean in on that promise and trust it? Yes. Not only can we, we should. And we desperately need to. See, when God reveals this, when God reveals how truly near He is, how imminent, the word imminent is profoundly rich to me. I remember uh, getting this in seminary and not having a clue what imminent meant. Maybe you don't either. It just means an unavoidable proximity of nearness. I mean, God is near. He's so near, he's unavoidably near. Imminent is present. Present, very, very present. Uh, more present than we real. If we could get his imminence, his, how truly near he is, and how profoundly relational God wants to be with us, it's going to thrust us, catapult us into a radical departure from a faith that, <clears throat> that is just predictable and easily explained. Most of us, quite honestly, could come today and explain what's going on in our life pretty rationally. You know, I, I make budget because we budget or I don't make budget because I overspend or, or, you know, I'm healthy or unhealthy. And I can explain all of these things by what I do. And, and, and there's very... There's a very noticeable absence of the supernatural marking our lives. <clears throat> it's just not there. But when we pray and we come to Jesus like this, it's going to thrust us, catapult us out of faith that is ex unexpected and easily explained. And I think that's his desire. I really do. I am convinced that God is leaning into us. That is, He is leaning toward us, expectantly desiring response and relationship. Arms open wide, calling us to a new day of prayer. Friends, if that, if that sermon title of this series is just that, if it's just a sermon title, we missed it. Because I believe that marks the heart of God's desire and intention for this congregation. I'm convinced, I know, and I'm doing my very best to be like a child and take him at his word, to be like a scholar and study adamantly and mix all of that together and then just take Jesus at his word. I'm convinced that we'll be left in breathless wonder if we can do that congregationally. I'm convinced God will explode into the reality of our lives, into the life of this church if we can do this collectively. Listen, we have gone through a lot. We have moved through some transitions, maybe you didn't notice, that are almost unsurvivable in most Southern Baptist churches. It is, in fact, one of these transitions from a congregationally-led structure of church to an elder and staff-led structure of the church caused a massive split about 10 years ago here. It almost was a death blow. But did you know in the last eight years that you, congregation, have allowed God to breathe life into this church by making that transition almost, almost without any bumps or hitches? You just said, let's go, because this is God's direction. And it brought us to a new level. It, it, we went from uh, one service around 150, 160 to going to two services, bumping up against 200, new life, new vision. But what I'm telling you here is that was great, but now there is a new day that needs to dawn again. That was a new day. That was an awesome day. And that, it, it took a lot of unity and focus and commitment to a vision and mission. But I am telling you today that we cannot move from this point in the life of our church until a new day of prayer dawns in us. As crucial as it was to change the leadership structure of our church so that we could grow without toppling, it is more crucial than ever that we allow God to bring us into a new day of prayer, to let a new time dawn in our lives of prayer. And I'm not just talking about praying more 
or louder or longer. I'm talking about approaching God new in our prayers. I'm talking about looking for opportunities to connect with Him and understanding that's His desire. I want to tell you that we cannot expect more from God if we remain unwilling to offer Him more of us. I promise you we are at that crossroads. So if you want us to advance the mission, if you want to be a part of a church that can say, we are truly letting God make disciples in and through us, I am telling you with all the certainty that I could muster in my heart that we have gone as far as we can go in that endeavor with our current yieldedness to Him in prayer. A new day in prayer dawning is not an option if the mission is mandatory. So that means 100% of us have got to say, God, whatever you want to lead me to, however you want to do this, I'm in. So church, I urge you to abide and pray. Remain in fellowship with the Father. Talk incessantly with Him. With singular faith and focus on Jesus, abide in Him and let His words, His words, seep deep into the fabric of your soul so that they move you in the direction of the Spirit and cling to His words. It will be done for you. It'll be done for you. Wrap your heart around this great promise from Jesus. If you ask for anything in my name, I will do it. Church, I want to ask you to take every form of praying in your life right now. Take every form of praying that doesn't look Jesus in the eyeball. And I want to ask you to ask God to destroy it. Take every form of prayer that doesn't look Him squarely in the eye with expectant certain faith and ask God to obliterate it. Get rid of it. And to start over. Lay hold of this dear Jesus with everything you've got. With urgent certainty in and through the prayer. And I promise you that He will meet you there. Really. He really will. Let's pray. Father, uh, I don't have any words for you, Lord, now, so hear my heart. Do this. Do this that is inexplicable in us that I have no words for right now, accomplish it. Right now, in this moment, may the supernatural collide with the natural and obliterate all that is not of you. Leave us standing with only that which honors you. In Jesus' great, great name, amen. And I'll walk you through this again. What we did last week, we're going to do again because I think there's great value in it. We're going to start with instrumental music right now, and we're just asking you to let the message soak in, okay? I've been rambling for 35 minutes or so. Let the word that God has spoken into your life just take root for a second. Let it soak in. And without pause or another cueing, one of our deacons is going to come up at, at about a minute and a half into that music, and they're just going to pray for our offering like we do. I'm not going to stand up and say, now's the offering and here's the da-da-da-da. She's going to come forward and they're going to pray. Because the offering is a part of our worship. It's a response back to God. And then we're going to finish up with congregationally singing together. You can stand during that time or you can stay seated. Honestly, you can do either one. It doesn't matter. Okay? You do whatever makes you feel free to worship. And then we conclude. Okay, so that's how the next few minutes are going to go together. Don't let the newness of that create any awkwardness, okay? Just be free and let God do what he wants to do in you, through you, okay?
Jesus Hill, where your blood was spilled for my ransom. Everything I once held dear, I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, and lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Only in me. Lead me to the cross. You know how we say, um, no, no one's here by accident? Well, we know that for certain now because there's only one way in and one way out. Now, we always believe that God has ordained who is here, but we, it's easier to get that when you, there's just one way in, one way out. If you need help getting here, there's a map on uh, the website. I think we've also got a map printed out for you somewhere. Um, looking for that note there. That's here somewhere. Uh, maps are available in the information center by the water fountain so that... A, that clear uh, map looking holder it's got maps that you can hand out as you invite people to come worship with you because listen they're not going to drive by you have to be coming to Covenant you have to be coming here or to the dentist or to the Y alright so there's a couple options but that doesn't create a lot of traffic we need you to invite people to come worship with you please do that uh, drive-in movie family night uh, this Friday, June 28th, 7 o'clock is right here. We're going to do a move-in, drive-in movie inside because it's light till like 11 o'clock here. Not really, but 9.45 and we would be up way late if we start the movie that late. Isn't that right, Nate? Nate, where'd you go? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So bring lawn chairs if you want. If you want to pretend you're outside while you're inside, that's really cool. And we can open the doors. Probably not, but you, I'm just saying that. Uh, we'll have, uh, bring snacks. Uh, share with your friends. The movie showing will be Ice Age 3. It will be hilarious. And we'll have a great time together. But do take the opportunity to invite your friends to be a part of that, okay? Tom. Good. Good. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Roger. Tom, that's where Nate is. Nate's standing in the hallway with his children and his wife, and if you leave, you won't get one of those. All right. If you study guide, I will have them available. God bless you. You are dismissed. Thank you for being here.